probably oh. from our sushi. Trenton got sushi on the table. <laughs> of course he did. <clears throat> how do people want to start podcasts? I don't even know how to do an intro to a podcast. I was going with it. Are we rolling? Yeah. We've got Cole Breeden here with, uh, he's our intern. We're lucky to have Cole here as an intern. He's a good fisherman, apparently. So I want to talk about your year. This is a brand new podcast. Our very first one was Dry as a Popcorn Fart. Yeah. So hopefully you can help. Yeah. Yeah. But it was an intro. So we really couldn't talk about anything fun in our defense. So they're talking, they're talking in the back. We're going to go right on through it. Okay. Maybe it's a learning learn. experience. There's it's a, a learning, learning experience. Thing. So tell me about your championship, which was in March. Yeah, it was the first weekend of March. It was actually right after the big cold front that we had come through, whenever it was iced out for, like our lakes here were freezing all the way across. Even Grand Lake, where we were at, had a lot of ice on it. And so it was a... Uh, where was it? Grand Lake, okay, Oklahoma. Grand Lake. So right. it's still kind of... A little bit outstretched from the Ozarks, but still real similar. It's kind of home turf for you, though, right? A little bit. I've never been there before, before this week. Really? Yeah, but it's it's, it's only two hours from, from Springfield, two and a half. So, okay. Um, it was definitely a, a tough tournament because of the conditions. Since so, that ice happened the weeks before, and it was uh, water temp was low 40s. Before we get into it, how do you qualify for <clears> this thing? How many people were fishing it? Give me that back. So, uh, Major League Fishing has a kind of uh, different regions or divisions that they have throughout the country. So there's a uh, central division, which is what we're in. You have to finish in the top 10 of a tournament throughout the year, and then top 10 from each tournament qualify for the championship. And then they send about 200 boats to each championship. Okay. So there was 200 people you fished against in this tournament. Who got second? A uh, team from Murray State. Murray State. Do you remember third? Yeah, uh, he's a guy from Kent State that fished by himself. And actually it's pretty cool because all three of us, first, second, and third, were all fishing the same little area. And uh, the guy, this was kind of an awesome week for the guy that finished third because he fished in his uh, aluminum boat, um, you know, small motor compared to everyone. And we had a we had a 30 minute run ourselves and it was about an hour for him. Okay. So he had a lot less fishing time every day and he was still right there. And so, you know, I feel like might have been different if you would have sure. had more time to fish. But it but wasn't. And it wasn't, won, yeah. So that's awesome. So tell us about how, what you were fishing, you know, leading up to it, conditions you, you touched on a little bit. Yeah, so like when we were practicing throughout the week, um, we kind of take off from the mid to upper end of the lake. And like I said, it was really cold. Water temp was very cold. And a lot of Grand Lakes kind of a little bit dirty. And whenever you get cold and dirty, it's really hard to catch fish. So um, first morning of practice uh, we spent kind of the mid lake area and it just wasn't it didn't look very good for us and we weren't really catching things so we thought you know let's just run all the way down to the dam see what it looks like down there see if we can find some clear water and so we uh, pulled into a creek and thinking we were going to catch them on those transition banks the steeper banks leading into creeks and we just put the troll motor down and started fishing and we didn't really catch anything until we got like three quarters of the way back and then we just kept fishing and we caught more and more and more the further we went back. None of them were very big, but you know, we figured catching a limit each day would do us good. So uh, second day of practice, we just did the same thing, hit the back of a lot of creeks in one little area. And we what just- What were you throwing? Uh, jerk bait was the only thing we could get a bite on. This guy right here? Yep, so this mega bass uh, jerk bait's a Twilight PM. Um, it's a got one, a- A 110? A 110, just a regular 110. Just a 110. And we actually, we're getting bites very shallow. So they were from two to six foot probably. Were they up there sunning? Like was it sunny I think I, It was sunny a lot of the time and I think because it was so cold, they moved up there to get the sun, but there was no big fish to be seen. So I figured they had to be a little bit deeper on some sort of structure. What do you mean there's no big fish to be seen? Like all the fish we caught in practice were no bigger than two and a half pounds probably. Okay. And so with it being sunny throughout the week, we were hoping that okay, we'll spend our time in this area where there's a lot of fish and maybe with the warming water, we'll get some big females that move up. But 
I mean, we were just wanting to get a limit because we knew how tough it was. So you were just thinking, if we can get a limit, if we could get yeah, 12 our, pounds. Our whole mindset was the first two days, let's let's just catch a limit. We don't care if they're 10, 11 pounds, whatever. And then the third day, maybe our area will start to produce larger females, and then we'll give ourselves a shot to win. So the first day, you know, we, we came into weigh and we had about 13 pounds. So we're like, okay, we'll be sitting like... 10 to 20th probably and we came out came out with a lead that first day with 13 almost 14 pounds so we were really surprised by that and uh you know the second day of the tournament we kind of tried to figure out maybe where some bigger fish were and you know we were dragging little finesse jigs and throwing an alabama rig we we're trying everything to get fish to bite something else Mm -hmm. But we did not catch a single fish that week on anything else but a jerk bait. And when you were throwing that one tin up in two foot of water, some you places were just rake and bottom. Yeah, so thing? something we did is usually um, table rock. Whenever you're fishing early in the year, fishing that on eight or ten pound test to get it down there. But we upsized to twelve, just to try to keep it up. And a lot of times when we were catching them, we'd be twitching our rods up to keep it from digging down. Like catching them in fluoro. Or yeah, okay. yeah, straight fluorocarbon. So fluorocarbon, and it was really surprising to me. Like, how many did you lose? Did jerk you lose baits? Very many? No, we didn't lose any at okay. all. Okay, no, so it wasn't really digging too hard. Okay, it'd be so. A lot of the places we had, it would have semi-steep banks down to four or five, six foot, mm. and so, um, so say you had this this steep bank, a lot of fish would be sitting on it, and you bring your jerk bait right over their heads, and they'd follow it out over that six, seven foot of water. And that's where we'd catch was a lot it, of them. Was it very color specific? Like, did you try any other um, ones? So, colors? actually, the first two days of the tournament were sunny. And so, we were throwing um, some different colors. Caught some on this, but um, I, th I think most of the ones that first two days were on, like, a just a straight shad color, translucent shad color. I threw one that was all white. And then the third day... In the um, 110. In the 110. And uh, I threw another jackal jerk bait. And... Uh, just trying to get some different actions in there to try to see if they'd bite mm -hmm. anything better. But the 110 was probably the best player for us throughout the week. And then the third day, we got some a little bit of wind, some clouds. It was cloudy all day. So we were like, okay, this is our chance to catch a big bag if it's going to be like this. And so um, we, we started throwing this one a lot more because it's just our truce, a little bit brighter. Water, it's not real clear. And so um, we just started catching them on that the third day. And so that's kind of what we just stuck with all day. And we had a limit pretty early on the third day. Now back up, so you covered day one, so on day two, what happened? Right, so so day two, I would say we probably had six different areas or little stretches that we'd catch them on. And day two, uh, we kind of just ran those um, same things. And actually there was a pocket that we caught our limit out of very first morning in 30 minutes. It didn't take very long. Second morning we caught one fish out of there, but it was a three pounder. Now, a three-pounder is really helpful whenever it takes 13 yeah. pounds to lead a tournament. So that was a big fish for us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had another area that was a set of uh, kind of community slash marina docks. And there was a lot of fish around there, but none of them were very big. So that was kind of a catch-a-keeper kind of deal for us. We caught one three-pounder out of there on the first or second day. I think it was the first day. And then we had a couple other stretches of bank that was that steeper bank that we'd give them to follow out from. So we kind of just worked that one pocket in our marina docks and caught a small limit. And then we got to another um, bank that we hadn't fished the first day at all. We were kind of just trying to save whatever we could. And Why were you saving it? Just, just so that we didn't catch all the fish that were in there. Because that first day, we caught a limit out of that one pocket, and the second day we only caught one fish out of there. Mm -hmm. So since it's a three-day tournament, you kind of have to play right. what you have. And since so we it had, just look good. Yeah. It's just something you look good. Yeah, it's something that we, we caught fish on in practice. You know, we'd okay. catch a fish on a bank and then leave it alone. Gotcha. And, I mean, you can see them on live scope falling it out, um, you know, from where they're at. So we kind of just wanted something to hit for so day two and three. So live scope was a player in this? It was a huge player. Okay. We'll talk about that once you finish the day. Yeah, yeah. Breakdown. So... So the so we had a limit in the middle of the day on the second day, and then we started to move um, to that other place that we hadn't hit yet, and we ended up upgrading I think three times, and uh, that got us another 13 pound bag, and so um, that was kind of the best size that we saw on average from any spot. Um, so the th you know after the second day was over, we moved down to third because there was a team that caught a 17 pound bag. They had a couple good ones. Um, but we figured that they probably wouldn't be able to do that again just because how tough it was. And so... Do you have any idea what they were doing? 
throwing jerk. I mean, all the guys in the top ten were throwing jerk baits, and one or two of them are throwing Alabama rig. Guys in second actually caught a couple on a crappie jig, um, but it was a very jerk bait dominant tournament for okay. sure. And I mean, um, Grand Lake, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and just with the water being so cold, I don't know why they wouldn't eat anything on the bottom, but they just wouldn't. And uh, yeah, so anyways, the live scope, I I gotta add that in there because it's really important. Um, they were kind of weird. So calm and sunny conditions, not always the best conditions to catch them with a jerk bait. But the water was also so cold. The area we were fishing was 40 to 42 degree water temp. And the fish would follow your jerk bait, right, if you just keep twitching it. So you had to work it fast enough to keep them interested. But since they're so lethargic, you had to work it slow enough for them to be able to catch up to it. So it was kind of a slow, steady, really small twitches. You don't want too much action out of it, but you want to keep it moving. So it was small twitches kind of mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. Maybe not constantly, but... Mm -hmm. that makes sense. a lot faster than most guys are fishing it because there was other guys in our area doing the same thing and we saw several guys not catch a single fish and that's probably because either those fish were coming up there looking at the bait seeing it wasn't real or it doesn't trigger their instincts they swim away or if you get too fast they'll follow it but never catch up to it right so that's something we actually found out in practice and so that was a big player in us being able to catch them throughout the whole tournament mm -hmm. And something you may not have noticed, you can't observe the fish and without right. a live scope. Exactly. You're going, okay, we're on to something here. Yeah. Because yeah. you see the reaction. Yeah, you can't see that if you don't have live scope. You can see when you're fishing it too fast, though that one turned off or didn't come all the way. Mm -hmm. You saw when you're too slow, it got up to it. Exactly. Away, and and also, it, it helps you throughout the day because um, there's a lot of fish that follow it. And, you know, people work their jerkbait halfway back to the boat or something, and they'll reel it back in because they're fishing a bank or something. Keeps you engaged. It keeps you engaged, and like some of those fish on those steeper banks will follow it out. And if you reeled in halfway, you didn't give enough time. So a lot of times you had to work it almost all the way back to the boat. Mm -hmm. And did you get bit at the boat? On, uh, some of them would bait? bite, would bite semi close to the boat. And I had several fish that would follow my jerk bait up as I was bringing it mm -hmm. up to the boat. Mm -hmm. And you know we wouldn't have caught several fish if it wasn't for being able to pay attention to the jerk bait right. with live scope. So live scope was definitely a huge player with getting them to react understanding how they're relating to the banks and structure we were fishing. And yeah, so it was a really big player in just being able to get bites. So we're going down the bank now, the thing with live scope and they've got this new turret thing, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a player. We can talk about that later, but when you're going down the bank, your live scope is pointing forward. So were you having to just get it going, then you would turn face the bank, mm -hmm. throw, make your cast, examine your bait, examine, you know, watch the live scope mm -hmm. and then turn it forward, go down the bank. I mean, how are you managing that? So, if you if your boat is moving very fast, it's really hard to see a jerk bait. Since it's kind of slender, it's a little bit harder bait to see. So you kind of have to keep your boat moving at a really slow rate to be able to see a jerk bait. And so um, with it being sunny and calm those first two days, and even the third day it wasn't too windy, um, we just moved real slow down those areas. That way we could watch our jerk baits and and be able to see the fish because that, like I said, that was a really important part. So you have, to, yeah, I would. I would be kind of uh, parallel with the bank and then, you know, turn my trolling motor towards the bank, watch the jerk baits, and we'd just be kind of slowly drifting down mm -hmm. each bank looking. I got you. Yeah. Okay. So day three. So, um, yeah, so day three. Big important day. Um, big important day. Final day. Uh, we figured since at the end of day two, we found the best quality on that one single bank, that we needed to start there and uh, just milk it for everything we had because... Uh, we felt like that there were some three, four pounders there. I mean, we could see some on live scope the days before that would follow it, and they'd stay closer to the bottom, and they're a little bit bigger marks. So you can tell that there were some bigger fish. Mm -hmm. And so we figured with the wind and the clouds, um, if we could get any fish to bite, that was going to be our biggest bites. Mm -hmm. And so working down it uh, in the morning, we caught a couple small keepers um, right away. And on our first pass, you know, we worked it up and down several times. And we get about halfway down this bank, and my partner Cameron hooks into a pretty nice one and gets it all the way back to the boat, and it comes off, and it was three, three and a half pounds, mm. which is a big help whenever, you Yeah, know. that's a big fish on championship day. Yeah, especially when the weights aren't that big. I mean, that's days, a big fish. Yeah. And, you know, we just kept grinding it out, and uh, we lost a couple other ones that we didn't get to see that might have helped us, but... Um, 
you know, with that with that little bit of and wind and clouds. Did you lost any, any fish the first two days? Um, maybe a couple, but I don't think any that would have helped us. We didn't really lose that many fish. I mean, it was, were they just short striking it on day three, or why do you think you were losing them just, just out of chance? And... I have no idea. I mean, it might have been because they've been seeing our jerk baits the past two days, and, yeah. you know, they kind of get used didn't to really it. really eat it. Yeah, they might not. Have, like the one that Cameron had, it was just on the back hook. He had one hook on the back hook on the very outside right. of the mouth, and those just don't stay on a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, we kind of dealt with that a little bit. We had a couple fish we lost, but not too many. Yeah. I mean, maybe two more that So you're came saying off. you lost three fish that day that you can remember that were, you could tell like, hey, those would have helped. That, that, yeah, especially the one especially that we saw, that them. really would have helped yeah. us. And then we actually, throughout the day, we're catching, you know, between a pound and a half to two and a half pounders. And then um, we each caught an, one good one that was close to three. Each of us caught one that was maybe a little bit over three and a quarter. On jerk baits. On jerk baits. So we had two so good ones. So you're both throwing the twilight pin. Yeah, yeah, we back. were. Yeah. So that's when you know it's dialed if you're both throwing it. Yeah, I mean, and I threw. I mean, first thing in the morning, I was throwing some different stuff to try to get a different reaction. You know, to throw in different colors might get a different fish to trigger. Yeah. So I, I was trying to make it work, but Cameron, you know, was getting some bites, and it, it just seemed like those fish that were following it. I don't know what it was. I don't know if they had seen those colors the day before. You know, because I was throwing the same jerk baits, but um, they ended up biting it. Uh, so Cameron had that good one that we lost on this color, and at that point, I started throwing it more, and we started catching them. So I just never yeah, put it down. Sure. Really. Yeah, that's what you do. Yeah, and that actually caught us a couple good fish. So uh -huh. um, that's just, I mean, almost all our fish the final day was from that right there. So what time? So like, okay, you lost that fish right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, it was probably. First thing, you had no fish in your live well. No, I think we had two little ones. Th two little ones, probably. Like two pounders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one might have not even been two pounds yet. And then so. you lost that fish at what time? <sighs> Probably 8 o'clock. Okay, and you're weighing in at? 3. 3 o'clock, you started it. Took off at probably 7. Seven, 7 o'clock. Seven yeah. Okay, so yeah. you got two and 8 o'clock and you lose a good one. And then what's your thought process? Like? I mean, it was really, I'm... Do you feel like you're chasing the trophy? Like, or do you feel like you got a chance? So what Where we were, were thinking, sitting? what we were thinking throughout the day is we need 15, 16 pounds to give ourselves a chance. And so we knew that we needed those two to three pounders plus a big one. Right. And we we're really hoping that we get that big bite throughout the day. And, you know, like I said, we caught those, you know, two pounders plus we caught two that were over three pounds. So we're like, okay, like we're giving ourselves a chance. What time did you have a limit? I'd probably fish for an hour. And we had, and a, had limit. a limit. Yeah. So eight o'clock, you had hour two fish, you lost a big one. So you caught your limit. I mean, it took us 40 hour. minutes to get there. Okay. And so, yeah, first, first 20 minutes is when we probably lost that one. And then, you know, the next hour we probably got ourselves a limit and then cold, you know, four or five. And it ended up with times. how much on that way? Championship day we had 14, 11 okay. or something like that. And, and then we so lost you, the other one that probably would have helped us a bit. And uh, You were pretty close to where you thought you'd, you'd be. Yeah, I mean, whenever we left that spot, whenever we had to go back to weigh in, I, I was truly thinking to myself, There's, we didn't do it. There's no way that we won because with these other con with the conditions and all these other guys, someone's going to catch yeah, a big some, fish today. Overcast and wind blowing. Your someone's going to catch 13 pounds plus a five plus pounder. Plus a five, yeah. And it was, I mean, we had two teams ahead of us, and the two teams behind us weren't too far behind, so yeah, it could, it was anybody's game at that point. And you were going into championship day. You were in what place? Third place. Third place behind by how much? It was a pound and a half. Two. Right. I mean, it wasn't too much. So they had to weigh. You were thinking, God, they got to have at least 13 and a half, right? Yeah. I was so the guys that uh, were in second right ahead of us, they were fishing the same area as us. But the guys who were leading were fishing a different creek. And well, you didn't get to see them net. I didn't never got to saw them. Our teammates can actually. You use a net? Yeah, okay. yeah, we can use a net. Our teammates actually were fishing the same area, and they ended up getting fourth. Okay. And so they were fishing the same area as the guys who were leading, and they caught two five pounders the second day. So we were like, with these conditions, surely they'll catch one more. Right. And so we really thought we needed that. So extra you're weighing weight. in. So we get, okay, this is so nervous walking up there with our fish, trying to look at everybody's bag. And of course, we get up there, everyone's there except for the guys that were in first and second. So we didn't get to see them. So we're sitting Are there just waiting for them to walk up. they holding them back? I don't know. They might have been just to do it, but uh, we kind of got in, in uh, line, in the way in line, in the order. So it went 10th, 9th, 8th. So we were towards the end of the line in third. Gotcha. And so we were waiting for these other two teams to come up so we could start the way in. And... We're sitting there trying to like add up, okay, they're gonna need this much or this much. 
and the guys who are leading walk up and they have two fish in their bag. And I was like, holy crap, like we have actually have a chance now. Cause I was talking to these <laughs> other guys in front of us and the biggest they had was 13. And I knew that we had 13. So I was like, we got all these guys beating. Those guys walk up with two fish. And so we knew that last team was the only ones that could have beat us at and that, that was point. was a third place team. They were in second. second we were in place third, team. yeah. That's right. Yeah. So they were in second. And so nervous. Okay, so they walk up to the tank and their bag, look, I mean, they have a limit and it looks pretty decent. And I'm like, man, that might look a little bit bigger than ours. And they already had a lead on us. And so I was like, hey, man, like, what do you guys think you have? And he's like, I don't think we're supposed to talk about it. And I was like, really? Come on, dude. In this situation, just yeah. give me a guess. And where were they from? Uh, Murray State. The Murray State guys, okay. Yeah, and so since he didn't tell us what he thought, we were sitting there look big eyeing them, you know, thinking that they're big. Right. And they through that water, they do look like they're pretty good-sized mm -hmm. fish. And so I've never been more nervous in my life and just anxious to, to see what happens because it was – I knew that it was going to be within a pound because of yeah they had a good bag and so and you're weighing in before them yeah we were weighing in before them and then so after them we knew that the first place wasn't going to do anything so we get up there weigh in uh, 14 over 14 and a half and you know it's kind of surprised at the weight we had um, you didn't think you had that much I didn't think we quite had that much maybe around 14 mm -hmm. but 14 three quarters I mean that was a decent bag for us and yeah. then those other guys come up and they're having to make up how much. Uh, now that you've weighed, did they? They're, they we were within a pound of them, so okay. they needed 13. about four. Yeah, a little bit under fourteen, yeah. thirteen something, or fourteen, a, four, low fourteen. Yeah, so you got to still be thinking after looking at the bag of. Yeah, fish. I was like, "There's no way yeah. that's got to be at least fourteen pounds." And they, I think they had a good one right there, so it kind of made it look good. So they walk up on stage and they put their bag on the scale, and the guy standing there, kind of close, starts nodding his head like yes, and I was like, "That means he got it." And then he says, and then the tournament director says, 13 pounds, whatever. And I was like, holy crap, we just won the national champ. But, like, we're not supposed to show it yet because we still got to wait for the last team to come up. But, yeah, Cameron and I hugged because we knew we had won. And uh, it was such a relief. It was the biggest relief I've ever had because it was so close. And, yeah. and he shook his head yes, so I was, like, already down. Yeah. I was like, they got it. Well, yeah, when you're that hyper-focused, you're watching the guy's reaction as he's yeah. watching the scale. Yeah. And I mean, why do you shake your head yes yeah. if you don't have it? I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> right. it, maybe it bounced up a little bit. Or maybe point, he but... was telling his partner, like, man, I think we only got 13 in this. Year. Right, yeah. And maybe he was, he was like, shaking yeah, his head that's like, how much it was. that's what I thought, man. We yeah. didn't do it. You yeah. know? But you're thinking the worst. Right, yeah. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, yeah. they got it. Right. No, but it was... Uh... So what did you end up winning by? Uh... About a pound, I think. Okay. Yeah. So what was the fish that put you there that day? So we actually had um, those two fish I was telling you about. Uh, Cameron caught one, I caught one, and they were both those good ones. What, was, and then, what were they? A little bit over three. And then we kind of figured out that since that wind was blown into that pocket, it kind of pushed the bait towards the back. And so we fished further back than we had been, and it was dirt shallow in the back of there. and Like a foot? A foot two foot, maybe three on the sides. It was just real shallow, like flat. And I uh, was throwing this trick bait back there, and we could, I could see some of them on the live scope. There was a group of them. It was dirty enough you weren't seeing them. No, not seeing them, them, just on the live scope. And, you know, I was catching a couple little ones, and then Cameron catches one that's two and three quarters. I mean, it's another solid fish that got rid of one that was a pound something. Yeah. So are you, I was what are you a, throwing? Are you throwing them on a bait caster, spinning around? Yeah, yeah, bait, bait cast. casters, 12-pound line, like a seven-foot six six nine to seven foot mediums mm -hmm. and uh, we run into getting hung up like bring up not bushes really. or anything no. like that. no i mean there wasn't really any cover down there at all it was just all rock and That's there was right. little pieces of brush or there was actually in that marina i was telling you about there was a a dock anchor that holds the cables a big yeah. piece of concrete and there was a little bit of brush on it and first day of the tournament we're working up between these docks and i can see a fish sitting on top of it so I sit there and fish for that fish, and I bring my jerk bait over him. He follows it a couple times, and never, and then he kind of, I don't know where he went mm -hmm. since he followed my bait out. So I went back there later, didn't see him. Came back the second day, and he was sitting there again on top of it. And he came up and nicked my bait to where I could feel a little bit of pressure, but he just like pushed it or mm -hmm. something. That's an interesting thing about live scope. I'm learning that just in the times I fished it is. You've got that fish on your bait, and you're watching that scope so hard that you almost don't feel the bite in the yeah. way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you see them eat it, and then, like, they're just there. Mm -hmm. 
I'm almost so focused on that screen that I yeah. almost don't feel the bite. Right. Because when they're getting right on that bait, yeah. especially that jerk bait, you're like, oh God. And then. So, yeah. For one, you can't get excited and mm -hmm. jerk too early. But something that I figured out is whenever those fish get close enough to where their, their blob is your bait blob and you can't tell right. if they have it or not, you have to speed your bait up. Because if they're that close and they made that run, right. if you speed it up, they're like, I mean, they're already chasing it and they make that little dart. They're going to get it. Yeah, it's a weird connection. And if you slow your bait down at that point, he's not going to, he might push it or yeah. just nudge it. He's not going to eat it. You throw glide baits enough, you realize that. I'd, right. rather get, I'd rather get three hard pulls on it yeah. instead of getting six and slow more ones. time. Right. I'd rather just commit. And you'll never catch fish on the, that slow pull that you're giving. Mm -mm. You're always going to get them when you speed and up. And people try to stop those glide baits. Same mm -hmm. thing with jerk baits. They try to right. stop them thinking, I'm going to draw this out. Yeah. Or I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to slow my pace to six six jerks no, instead to, of three to give him time to get up there and it, yeah it, but people don't realize how fast the fish can travel i right. mean and so that's something else like you said you aren't able to feel it a lot of the time so if you do twitch your bait a little bit harder faster or if you're throwing a swim bait and you speed it up a little bit you're going to feel the bite better because your line's tighter too mm -hmm. so that helps you get the reaction but also helps you feel the bite better yeah. so that's important really important thing that's cool so who, your partner what's his name Cameron Smith, uh, he went to high school in Ozark. Okay. Um, here. And you and went so, to Lebanon. Lebanon. And uh, he's a year older, so he just graduated. And uh, we fished every single high, or college tournament together. How do you the, pick a partner? So, whenever we came to school, there was five of us freshmen, and so our coach was just kind of randomly pairing us up, and um, we kind of just got paired together by coach for the first tournament, and we actually won the first tournament we fished, and so. At that point, we were like, any, there wasn't any thought like, well, these two may be two of the best. Maybe we should split them up. It's like basketball. Like you'd think you'd split the good ones right. with a weaker one, or is the thought process put your two best together? See, I you could go either way with it. I mean, yeah, it depends on because it matters your overall. I mean, points. because it does matter having that one person, you know, that can lead you to the fish. But then again, if you find the fish, you need. It's more effective to have two people catching the fish well. Two hammers. Yeah, and a lot of time Cameron, he, he likes throwing a drop shot and a jig, and sometimes he gets those sneaky bites by throwing that drop shot a lot. Yeah. And so that, I mean, he gets a lot of really key bites by, uh -huh. you know, he always has his bait in the right place. And so that really helps out a lot. So you guys complement each other pretty well. Yeah, and you know what's funny is some days I might catch all the fish, all five of the fish we catch, and then he might mm -hmm. the next day catch all five of the fish that we catch. It's kind of just, Sure. yeah. We kind of just rotate on that. So what all came from this? I see it says you got a Phoenix F-18 Pro. Yeah. Do you win a boat? We did win a boat. So it's a certificate for a Phoenix, but it goes to the school. Uh, then go to directly to us. So. And now these college athletes are getting paid, and yeah. you, you win a boat, and that goes to the school. Who, yeah. Who probably, and, and maybe I'm speaking well, they get turn. It goes to the team. It goes so to the school, a, and the school will give it to the team Okay, directly. well, then there's so. how many teams that are fishing out of boats? Six. So it just goes to whoever needs it? Well, probably. actually what this was was a certificate for a boat. And so what we did is we sold that certificate to a dealership for money to be able to travel more. Because jury pays for all of our travel expenses, food, hotel, so, entry fees. So you're supporting the program. I mean, that's... Right. That's I mean, that was... that was Trickled down. $24,000 towards the team, which is... Right. Really helps out a lot. Twenty four grand. That's what what a Phoenix 518 Pro... Well, it's, it was more than that. 115 Merc on it. It was a little bit more than that, but since it's a certificate and you give it back to the dealership, it's, you know... Yeah, I got you. Yeah, it translate, sense. you yeah. know. And... So the, how does that work? I think people probably would be curious like I have no idea you can't win money you can't. so from a tournament like this so the tournament organization does have winnings so uh, Cameron and I won another uh, it was FLW at the time at Lake of the Ozarks and the award to first place was two thousand dollars same exact deal where that money goes to the school but there is incentive programs so like Costa had one at the time that's how I got the Costas that I, that I wear um, and Nitro has incentive programs, so um, if you sign up through their programs and you win a tournament, say Nitro's, it's $7,000. So for this tournament, we won $7,000 through Nitro. Um, they go straight to us. To you? Yeah. For school or just cash? That's just cash. They write us a check and, and me and Cameron split that. Toyota does the same thing. Uh, we've gotten, I don't even know how many Toyota bonus bucks from tournaments, highest, highest placing finisher with the Toyota. Do you think that's something that's going to change? Do you think? No, no. I don't think they'll ever let anybody even else get this, involved. Even because with sports changing. Because of how much money is involved in fishing and 
how much you need sponsorship and money. You mean you mean the term organization Cash. going to the to anglers you. instead? Yeah. I don't think that'll change. And it's different if I don't know exactly how it works if it's a club. Yeah. And not uh so there's no I penalty, like if you went and fished a Wednesday night. No, no, we can win money. money outside of school. It doesn't matter at all. So how have you won some tournaments like that? I mean, you yeah. make a decent amount of money just picking up some little. Yeah, I mean, and... I um, I've got second place a couple weeks ago. Um, first two weeks before that, I won a couple this spring. Um, had a tour series at Table Rock. I won some money, a couple thousand dollars. Cool. And so yeah, that's none of that's. Regulated you can't get by anything. For that. You don't have to worry about no, that. and it's really nice that, that it's not monitored like that because yeah. it would it would make things much harder if it was. Yeah, because it's, it's is it an expense for you? I mean, is this cool? They're, are they covering your gas and food and lodging? For all of our college tournaments, yeah, they pay for everything. That's cool. And Fishing staying, license. And how anything. are you staying? How are you sleeping? Are you sleeping in some decent places? Or are you guys? Oh uh, well, there? you know, a lot of times it's maybe a cheap motel or something that might not be real nice. But uh, what we like to do is try to get you know, an Airbnb or yeah. someone's house. And As a group. And much nicer, and it costs a lot less for us. Right, if you got a group, that makes sense. Yeah. And Have you ever had any, like, any weird things happen while traveling? Anybody get lost, or where's... I mean, everyone gets Cameron lost on at? the road all the time, you know, taking yeah. wrong turns and stuff. But we played at, stayed at some pretty sketchy places. You never had any bad things? No, or? I mean, we never had... Luckily, I mean, some of the places we've stayed before, there's been anglers who have had their rods and stuff stolen. But, yeah. you know, we... We'll put away all of our stuff, lock it up, put the cover on the boat just as extra security measure more than anything. Because um, so, there's a lot of guys that just at our hotels are just walking around outside, or you see guys that are just sitting in chairs all over the place, and you're like, I don't, they're sitting here watching me. I want to put yeah. away all this nice stuff that they just saw. So you got, you're in your senior year? Yeah. So what's your year look like the rest of the year? Um, so actually, we're leaving on. Friday or Saturday for the St. Lawrence River Bassmaster National Championship. That'd be fun. Yeah, and then we have, so we're actually in the Major League Fishing, our conference. Um, I don't know what we're at right now. We should be leading school of the year in our conference. And so we have one more um, tournament on Lake of the Ozarks. And so that'll kind of determine if we win the division or not, which if we're, I think I'm pretty sure we're leading right now. So we should, uh, we should be able to hold that out yeah. because and that's like where those are. Yeah, I mean we have we have lots of guys who really like. You. Yeah, we re that really like. Uh, Trenton's done well there. Yeah. Um, you know, Jacob, another guy on our team. He, so Trenton, who works the front, he's joined you guys this year. Yeah, yeah, he's going to he be freshman? joining August. Yeah. He's a freshman. Yeah, we got nine Trenton new got freshmen Trenton got Chinese food in. on the table. Yeah, so it's a little sticky. We're gonna have to forgive him for that. And he <laughs> forgot the cardboard. Trenton's working here as a counter guy for us, and he knows fishing. I have a lot of fun with Trenton. Yeah. Um, so speaking towards that, how do you be a part? Do you have to be good to join the team? Like, can you just anybody? So, I mean, we're currently building the team because, you know, there's a lot of schools that have maybe 30, 40, 50 kids on the team and very large budgets. And we're moving that direction. But whenever I started, there was, I want to say, six, seven, eight guys on the team. And then my class was five. And how do they do that? Does everybody and so what I did is I messaged coach and kind of talked to him about joining and joined and since we have a small team everyone usually goes to all the tournaments but um now we have 12 13 graduating a couple but we're adding nine so our team's growing and so and coach is wanting to do that he currently retired from bass rick. pro rick he currently retired from bass pro so he could focus more on the school thing and you know the fishing industry has been a little stressful lately for a lot of people so um He's really trying to grow the team now that he has more time to focus on it and try to build up to that program. So usually before, we'd all travel to all the tournaments if we could, um, academics willing. You know, we stay behind for tests or something if we have to. But now that we have a lot more guys, we can split up and go to more tournaments. And that's what really helps you in school of the year standings. Because if we only go to 10 tournaments and do really well in them, but the guys who are in first place go to... 15 to 18 tournaments a year. Why don't they regulate that? Why don't they? They really it? should because that seems kind of silly. I always hated that. Like you could go and say, oh, "I'm going to qualify for the national championship in South Carolina if you fish every single tournament." I'm like, yeah. You should only qualify for something like that as if you're just dang good. Yeah. You know what I mean? But not right. just volume. Right. Yeah. And like those guys that always won school of the year, it's because they go to so many tournaments and they might have mediocre finishes. They might have really good finishes in a lot of them, and a lot of them do. But what also really helps is, you know, we've all, always had three to five boats at our tournaments. Those guys can take 10, 12 boats 
And so you have a lot better chance if you have more teams to do well. Mm -hmm. And so that not only helps them that way, but also um, we, we have a limited day, number of days we can miss for class. So they might tell us 10 days per semester you can be gone. So instead of going to just six, seven tournaments, we can split up and these guys go to six tournaments, these guys go to six tournaments. Now we have a lot more points accumulated through all the tournament series and whatever. So, and this year our budget is going up at Jury. They're giving us some more money, so that's really awesome. Nice, so, kick it up, Jury. Yeah, so Step it'll, it'll it fund us better and we also have more guys to send more places. Awesome. So it'll really help us out that way. And you've got a good coach. I'm always seeing him raising money on Facebook and I follow Rick on there. And, and um, I'm sure that's a big benefit, you know, cause not all teams maybe have somebody that really takes the reins like that at right. this point and, and fish college fishing is still pretty new in the grand scheme of things yeah i mean our team is i want to say six years old does missouri have a coach or is it no missouri and missouri, missouri state. state i mean um yeah but mizzou and missouri. we had a little bit of technical difficulty we filled the memory card <laughs> yeah. that's a first on the podcast <laughs> yeah. which is great because i think this is really important information for a lot of young anglers out there and I think in, in this podcast, we're trying to find our voice. And, and I don't want to be like everybody else that just drops the F-bomb and gets real goofy. And it's always, it's like so many of the same things. Like, I think right. I want this podcast to be informative. I want it to be inspirational. I, ho I hope that it helps young kids. I hope that it helps kids that are trying to navigate this industry. And I hope it helps small business owners, you know, anybody, any age, you know, take some insight. I think this podcast is going to really help kids in high school that you're the national champion, you know, or one of them, you and your partner. And how cool is it to hear from you, you know, and hear this story. And, you know, we don't go into a ton of detail on the fishing, but it'd be really interesting to hear from you and for these kids to hear from you, you know, first of all, what you would tell them to do, you know, if they're wanting to get into college fishing, where right. should they try to go? And maybe why should they go there? And maybe that's to find someone that has a coach or a program that has that structure. Right. So what would you tell them? Okay, so first thing that I would want to know whenever I was still in high school, because I was not very good fisherman in high school. I mean, you know, I watched all the videos, tried to learn everything I could, but I still hadn't had the experience or time on the water to learn those things that I watch videos on. And so, um, you know, it didn't seem like I was a college fisherman at that point. I think that's really important for a lot of people to know is you don't have to be really good uh, to fish in college. Which is kind of different. Yeah. Because as a basketball player, you got to be good to play any... Right, you, know, you have to be to really good. Jury, you got to yeah. be good. But you don't realize the development that you create from fishing all around the country and being around other guys who do it with you. I was just thinking that when you were talking about lacrosse, I'm like, dude, the value of you, if you go to go fish pro, you've been to lacrosse. Right. You have history at lacrosse. You know this yeah. pool, that pool. You know this had some grass. Right. And I've heard a lot of professionals talk about it. There's two ways to become a pro fisherman. That's from fishing as a co-angler and learning from professionals that you fish with or fishing in college because you get the same experience. And, you know, you don't get to go and learn from a pro, but say, so we're going to the St. Lawrence River this next week. And I've always watched it. It's fun to watch it, catch a big smallmouth. But what do you see? You see him throwing a drop shot and, you know, really clear water. I mean, you don't really see exactly what they're doing. And so if you never go up there, and go out there and go to try to catch those fish, all you see is a spinning rod and they're going out and fishing out in the middle. Yeah. And so like getting to put that into action, I've done a lot of research on what to look for. So until you get that experience to go figure it out yourself, it doesn't really stick with you and you don't really learn that. And so that's been something that's extremely important is just getting that experience. And I've heard a lot of pros talk about that. If you want to get, if you want to be pro, if you want to fish in college, go out and go fishing. Like, you just need to fish as much as possible. Now, when you when you go to decide, like, let's say that a kid listening is from Kennesaw State and the other's from Murray State and one's from Missouri, message, go, go into their counselor, message, what do you do to... Okay, so what I did um, whenever I was looking around at different schools was I messaged either their Instagram pages, Facebook pages. Um, Rick, I actually found his email on the jury website and emailed him, and he was the first one to email me back right away. And so I just kind of got into a conversation with him and I decided that I was going to jury before any of the other schools messaged me back really. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just had a conversation with him. Um, he was looking to grow the team with some guys that had experienced tournament fishing. Um, and I fished high school, um, fished the TBF uh, before that, that they had here in Missouri, just kind of a youth fishing deal. And so, you know, whenever I told him I've been tournament fishing for, you know, a number of years, he said, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for guys who, have the passion for one and have had some ex experience tournament fishermen because before they had guys that were just 
hey, you're a jury, you want to come join the fishing team? They didn't really know what was going on. So mm -hmm. he was he was mainly looking for the passion because he realizes how much you can grow as a fisherman while you're in school. Now, mm -hmm. being really good before you come, obviously that helps out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but just being able to develop yourself um, is a huge deal. So if, as long as you have the passion for it, uh, you're going to be able to create yourself, um, you know, make yourself into a better So you're fisherman. saying don't necessarily avoid fishing in college. Because right. Don't maybe... be scared or intimidated to fish in college just because you've never won a right. high school tournament. My, my highest finishing tournament was my senior year, and it was 16th place. So 16th place senior year. Yeah, I know, and, and I, I never finished. Yeah, did I catch a limit very often? Not really. I mean, you know. Right. And, you know, I'm out and you know the techniques to use, but knowing where so exactly to use So what got you over it, that hump, you think, when you got there? I think, for one, time on the water. And, um, you know, the first couple turns that we fished were all kind of in this area, Bull Shoals, um, Dardanelle, Table Rock. And so yeah, just honestly spending that time out there. And, yeah. and also brainstorming with teammates because – um, going into that first tournament, uh, myself and a couple other freshmen laid a map down, talked about everything. Uh, I think one of the guys talked to a friend that was from that area, and you know he gave us some pointers. Not doing, we didn't do what he told us to, um, but just sitting around and talking about different stuff. And yeah. so you know, I go out and I learn from a single experience. You go out and you go learn something else. So if we talk about that, yeah. and I can use your experience for my benefit and vice versa, yeah, give communication. we can learn twice as fast. And, yeah. you know, it might not stick as well because it wasn't my experience, but, you know, whenever you do that with the whole team, you gain a lot of information really quick, yeah. and you get to learn a lot faster than you would just by yourself mm -hmm. or in high school, you know, because a lot of those kids might not be fully committed to fishing or, you know, on your team or yeah. whatnot that you talk to. But once you get to college, you got other guys that are really passionate about it, yeah. and you know that want to share and learn with you so mm -hmm. that's been a really big benefit for me very cool so. well you just finished up in lacrosse and you got what place up there tenth and uh we'll talk about that we'll have you on again and uh, we'll follow you through your season so guys if you see coles join us we're going to be following him through his senior year uh next one we'll probably talk about lacrosse and how you caught him there yeah and then uh, we'll just keep on down the road. Hopefully how I've won the New York Hopefully tournament. Hopefully so. And yeah. that was for the championship? Yeah, this is the Bassmaster National Championship. So this is this, this year? Well, this is Major League Fishing. Major League Fishing. This next one will be Bassmaster. Bass, and you're doing both? Yeah. Okay. And, and the Bassmaster one, if you're in the top four teams for that tournament, those eight guys from the top four teams get to fish the Classic Bracket, which if you win that, you go to the Bassmaster Classic. So gotcha. the Bassmaster one's really important to try to further your career. So Very cool. that's an exciting one. Well, good luck. Thank you. We'll be seeing you again, guys. Make sure you like and subscribe. Drop a comment as to what you want to see us talk about, maybe even with Cole or maybe who else we may be able to have on this podcast. And um, if you want to be on this podcast, shoot us an email at info at modernoutdoormedia.com. Thanks for chatting it up. Yeah, thanks. I enjoy talking about fishing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. We'll see you next time.